And on today's show, uh, we want to talk about this. The deadly impacts of climate change are here and now. Loss and damage can no longer be swept under the rug. So that was Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations. And that phrase that he mentioned, loss and damage, we heard those words over and over and over again at the 27th United Nations Climate Change Conference, a.k.a. COP27. Loss and damage needs to be part of the core agenda of COP27. Addition of loss and damage on the agenda is a significant achievement. The economic cost for loss and damage for Africa is estimated at almost United States dollars, two trillion, excluding non-economic losses. We are ready to address loss and damage because too many countries cannot shoulder the climate crisis on their own. The time for talking on loss and damage finance is over. We need action. But what do we mean when we talk about loss and damage? Well, let's start by replaying a longer version of that first clip you heard. Take a listen. Loss and damage needs to be part of the core agenda of COP27 to meet the pressing humanitarian needs of those that are trapped in a crisis of public financing fueled by debt and yet have to fund climate disasters on their own. So that's the uh, Prime Minister of Pakistan, and he is speaking directly from experience. A few months ago, his country was hit with devastating floods. It was terrible. The, the result of historic monsoon rains, more than 1,700 people died, millions more left homeless. The destruction of everything, schools, hospitals, roads, just massive. The estimated cost of rebuilding is about 15 billion U.S. dollars. Further, the amount of money the country stands to lose because of all that was lost in the floods, another 15 billion. So that's $30 billion and more than it can afford, according to the post-disaster report put together by Pakistan, the EU, the UN, and the World Bank. The report says, given Pakistan's limited fiscal resources, significant international support and private investment will be essential for a comprehensive and resilient recovery. Now think about that for a second. They're saying that Pakistan can't afford to rebuild on its own. Now, Pakistan is among the top 10 countries in the world most affected by climate change. The rains that fell there this summer, some provinces saw six or seven times what they'd usually see in the season. And the consensus at the global table is that climate change made these events worse. So this is what we mean when we say loss and damage, the negative impacts of human-caused climate change, and not just the extreme weather stuff, but also the more gradual stuff, like sea level rise and hotter temperatures. And when it comes to the UN and global negotiations, this is what it comes down to. It is up to the G20 countries responsible for 80% of global emissions that we are beholden to for our survival. Our survival is being held to ransom at the cost of profit and an unwillingness to act, despite the ability to do so. So that's the Prime Minister of the Cook Islands. That's a, an island country northeast of New Zealand. His point, and the point that many developing countries, the ones most vulnerable to climate change, the point that they're making is that the costs of climate change that result in these huge price tags of loss and damage are constantly being shouldered, mostly by countries that cannot afford to keep rebuilding. And you know who should be responsible, they say? You guessed it. The countries that contribute the majority of global emissions, mainly the G20, uh, Canada, the US, China, Russia, Japan, the UK, the list goes on and on. And the prime minister of the Cook Islands was right. According to the UN Environment Program, G20 countries contributed 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions in 2020. So coming back to COP27, at the conference, one of the key items on the agenda was the establishment of a loss and damage fund to help developing countries deal with the destruction of climate change and funded in part by those large emitters. There was a lot of resistance and a lot of questions about liability 
from several countries, which would be on the hook for payment. And for a while, it didn't look like a deal would be possible. I mean, the conference went almost two days over. And then this. Today, here in Sharm el-Sheikh, we established the first ever dedicated fund for loss and damage, a fund that has been so long in the making. So the deal's been struck. The, the loss and damage fund, it's been agreed to. But, like, what does that mean, right? Like, what's actually in the deal? And, and what's still TBD? Well, John Woodside is going to help us answer those questions. John, you're a, you're a climate finance reporter with the National Observer. I, I didn't even know that was a, a thing, like a title, climate finance reporter. Yeah, it, um, you know, climate finance is, uh, I think, one of the major hurdles in, uh, in sort of any kind of diplomatic negotiation. Uh, it's often one of the big bottlenecks to actually getting anything done. So, sure. so yeah, one of the things I try and do with the National Observer is is uh, really kind of track the money that's, you know, either fueling the climate crisis or the lack of money that's preventing solutions from, from being developed. And, and you were in Sharm el-Sheikh, uh, Egypt, for COP27. You just recently got back. Can you tell me a little bit more about those sort of precious overtime moments that we were, you know, mentioning earlier? So, like, which countries have agreed to, to what exactly? Right. So... I think the biggest uh, takeaway from COP27 this year was the creation of this loss and damage fund, or at least an agreement to eventually set this up. What was agreed to in Egypt was basically a year-long process where now there's going to be a transitional committee set up of, uh, of about two dozen countries that are going to that are going to have to hash out the details and report back next year on what this fund might look like. So at this point, we don't know which countries are going to be involved, but we do know that every country in the UN system has agreed to saying that this is an important thing to do. Um, so that's the rich, wealthy, polluting countries, as well as developing countries, vulnerable island states, all sorts of countries have agreed to this. So it is really a sort of a whole global uh, agreement that's been set up right now. And, and do we have an idea of which countries would be on the receiving end? So, so who would be entitled to compensation? Right. So I think this is actually going to be where the really where the fight plays out. Because a fund like this, a loss and damage fund, is supposed to compensate uh, poorer countries um, in, in the language of the system. We're talking about the quote-unquote developed countries paying into a fund and then the quote-unquote developing countries being able to access it. The fight that's happening now is uh, is basically to say, well, maybe, maybe the pool of donor countries should be expanded because the developed you know, the, the developed label would not apply to countries like uh, China. Now, hold on. Uh, I wondered to myself, as John was saying this, how is it that China can be considered a developing country? Well, it turns out all of these labels are actually just kind of arbitrary and that within many organizations, countries actually self-declare whatever it is they think they ought to be. And, and China indeed does claim developing country status within many of these organizations. This is despite the fact that it has something like $18.3 trillion in GDP, uh, second only to the United States. And in terms of climate, in 2020, it was by far the largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions. But we do have to keep in mind that China's population, right? I mean, it has something like a billion and a half people. And if you take, for example, its GDP and you divide it by all of those people, then it does fall down the list. But how is it that we have this conversation about a loss and damage fund and, and compensation when we can't even really agree on what these kinds of terms mean and who are the haves and who are the have-nots? Point is, it's complicated. Rich countries have kind of come around and said, well, we're interested in setting up a fund like this, but maybe only if we expand the donor pool. So some of you guys are going to have to pay into it. And maybe the only ones who should be able to access the fund will be the most vulnerable. But, right, because yeah. like, I have to say, one of the reasons that I was sort of curious about that question in particular was I was wondering if Canada would be entitled to compensation for any reason. And I, I suspect maybe I know the answer, but, but this is a country that is not immune to the kind of climate disasters that we've seen around the world, whether we're talking about wildfires or flooding. I mean, pick your poison, right? The way the loss and damage fund is sort of imagined, right, is that countries like Canada would not be able to access the money uh, from it. We would be a country that's paying into it. 
Um, the, the reason for this is because we are a very wealthy country. And, uh, and on top of that, we're also a historic emitter. Uh, kind of any way you count it, Canada is in the top 10 countries for, for emissions, for historic emissions. And uh, on a per capita basis, we're the number one. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're just, quite frankly, a huge emitter that is contributing to the problem. Okay, now I asked John what he meant by that. And he responded with this analysis, looking at Canada as a historic emitter. So between 1850 and 2021, Canada emitted 65 and a half gigatons of carbon dioxide. That represents 2.6% of all of the emissions over that entire time period from the entire world. And I can tell you at no point in history has Canada ever comprised 2.6% of the world's population. So Canada, the largest emitter per capita, that image of Canada, the good and the green, mm, maybe not so much. There's a polluter pays principle. The ones who are causing the problem are going to be the ones who, who pay for the solution is, is the ideal. Right. Um, and, and, and I think that then gets into the argument around, well, what should China's role be? Because China is a major polluting economy, but on a per capita basis, still, uh, still not anywhere near Western Europe and, and North America. So, right. so that's really kind of the debate that's playing out here. And I guess if you look at historical emissions, I mean, the United States would be right at the top of that list, right? Absolutely, yeah. I think that is. I think that is really going to be where the fight plays out over this next year. Is because the United States in these negotiations, uh, they, they were the biggest blocker of it. Um, close observers were were watching the United States really get in the way of of trying to pass anything like this because the United States and and other countries uh, like it. They don't want to be held liable for for kind of damages. Because where, where did the conversation go on that front, that, that establishment of, of the idea of liability? You know, are, are certain countries at fault? Are they responsible for the damage being caused to other countries? And, and do they owe them money? Like that kind of language. That, I think that is exactly the tricky, the tricky part here. The loss and damage fund that's being discussed at, at this stage has nothing to do with holding anyone liable. It is not to have any sort of legal compensation. It is trying to set up a, a new fund that's you know, going to have to be in the billions and, and eventually trillions of dollars if, if it's going to be successful. It's going to need to be at a scale that big. Well, and, and I wonder, I mean, what's the consequence if the countries of the world don't pony up the money that you're talking about, the billions, possibly trillions of dollars required? That is, I mean, I think that's a fantastic question. It's, I mean, one, it's recognizing that rich countries are the ones who are historically most responsible, but are also the ones in the best position to adapt to the crisis that we're facing and, and really kind of need to lead the transition. Um, but the, you know, the flip side of it was recognizing that if we're gonna ask countries to increase their climate ambition, if we're gonna ask them to actually bring emissions down at, you know, at a pace and scale that's, uh, that, that's needed to avoid climate disaster, we need to make the money available. But also, let me put it this way, when we agree to something like loss and damage, but then we continue financing fossil fuel expansion, that also hurts trust in this process because these countries are saying, well, wait a minute, you're not even addressing the, the cause of the problem here. So, so, John, I'm trying to gauge your tone and listen to your words, and I'm trying to figure out, are you optimistic about where this is going, seeing how past agreements have failed spectacularly? That is, uh, yeah, that, that's an interesting question. I think it's an undeniable win, but but the devil is going to be in the details. It's <laughs> all going to be about well, what actually gets set up here because there's there's good ways to do this, there's bad ways to do this, and there's really complicated, incoherent ways to do it in the middle, <laughs> and and that is really going to be the the issue, right? John Woodside, you sure know your stuff. Uh, thank you uh, for this. This has been really helpful. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you. I really appreciate this. And uh, yeah, great topic. Cheers. Okay, so bottom line looks like there's still a lot of details to be worked out uh, about this loss and damage fund over the next year. Uh, COP28, by the way, will take place next November in the United Arab Emirates.